subsect is about infection. And um, as I mentioned before, it's impossible for me to cover 100% word to word. That's impossible. I can't do that in, in two and a half hours. So I'm going to cover the most important points, the main points. And you are responsible for the textbook anyway. But my advice is whatever I'm covering and stressing on here, this is your primary focus. Focus on this first. Okay, I know what are the main points. I know the core abilities. I know the student learning objectives. So I'm going to help you with this. So do this first and then add anything else. But this is the most important that we're going to focus on. Uh, if we start with the microorganisms in general, micro means small organisms, living organisms, and this can be any, um, this can be uh, bacteria, uh, fungus, and protozoa, and viruses. It can be any one of those. We will discuss all the details. So microorganisms can be in the form of bacteria, fungus, protozoa, virus, and we will talk about each one of those. Um, microorganisms, all of them, any one of the four, they can grow in artificial culture medium, meaning you get like a dish or something, and you put the, the essential nutrients in general, and any one of those, when you put it on this dish, it will grow. And we will talk about other things that can produce disease, but they cannot grow on artificial culture. So all four can or can uh, grow on artificial culture. Any one of the four. Um, some of these will be non-pathogenic and some will be pathogenic. Pathogenic. Patho means disease. Genic means generation. Generating. So pathogenic means they can generate disease. Okay? Disease causing microbes. Non-pathogenic means they do not generate disease, non-pathogenic. Um, some of these will be the normal flora, like what you have in your teeth. Okay, what you have in your teeth is actually non-pathogenic. It doesn't do anything, uh, but we get the teeth decay and it causes problems. No, it doesn't cause problems. It does only if you're not keeping the dental hygiene. If you have a lot of sugar, they will grow above normal, they will become more aggressive, and they start to invade. So under normal circumstances, they do not invade. And this is what's meant by normal flora. Normal fl flora are these organisms in all different areas of the body that are, put three lines under this, under normal circumstances. Under normal circumstances. They do not cause disease. So saying non-pathogenic, it means it's not. It, it means it doesn't mean it's impossible to cause disease. It can, but I'm saying under normal circumstances. If everything is good, everything is okay. They are not supposed to cause anything. Some of them are even better than that. Not just normal inhabitant of the body, but they are actually beneficial. So not just not harming you. They are actually benefiting you. And the best example for that is. Um, these uh, bacteria in your colon, for example, these bacteria in the colon, the, some of them produce vitamin K. So it's not just non-harmful, it's beneficial. The types of microorganisms, uh, it can be, we said it's bacteria, it's virus, it's fungus, it's protozoa, and we will have some more details about that. But if you're talking specifically about uh, dividing these bacteria in the shape, if the bacteria looks circular like this, like spherical structure, you call it caucus. Caucus means spherical, sphere, spherical structure. If it looks like rods, so you're looking under the microscope, and you see it looking like this, like spherical structure, you call it caucus. If it looks like rods like this, you call it bacillus. If it is like a rod but it's bending like this, it's called vibrio. If it is rod but spiral like this, you call it spirella. Okay, if it is different shape, you call it pleomorphic. Pleo means different. Morphic means shape. This is just a translation. Pleomorphic, different shapes, okay? Um, spirochetes, it's just bending like these. 
Now, if you have two of these cocci, like this, two sphericals, and they will stay together. Another two spherical structures that stay together. Another, if you look under the microscope, you see duplets of cocci. You call it Diblo caucus. Diblo means double. Translation, Diblo double. It even sounds the same, right? So Diblo caucus means two. You look under the microscope, it's not individual. It's two, 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 like this. Sometimes it's staphylo. This line means related to this. So staphylo caucus. Staphylo means looks like the grapefruit. You know how the grape looks like? A lot of spherical structures. It looks exactly like this. So this is a staphylococcus means a group of cocci that are arranged together. They, so you look under the microscope, you see it looking like grapefruits. Um, I mean grapes. Okay? It look like grapes. Group like 15, 20 here, another 15, 20 here, and so on. Looks like grapes. Streptococcus. Strepto means one after one after one after one. So it is in the lines, uh, still caucus. So these are different forms of cocci. This is a tetrad. What tetrad means? Four, Four caucus. So one, it, the caucus can be individual, like here is one spherical, spherical, spherical. Or twos, you call it diplo. Or fours, you call it tetrad. Or it can be in a line like this, you call it streptococcus. Or it can be like this, staphylococcus. I would say out of all of this, the most important that you have to remember is anything related to caucus. So one, two, three, four, five. This is the most important of this part, okay? You have to remember this. So if you see a question about staphylococcus or streptococcus or diplococcus, you know exactly what we're talking about, okay? And you'll see the description. If you have um, a group of spherical structures in a line, one after one after, what do you call this? Streptococcus, if you see it, a, a group or a bunch of uh, uh, cocci that are arranged together. Staph. Staph. If you see two together, diplets, diplo, four, tetra. So this is the most important part in this one. Okay. Um, next part will be the virus, and then the fungus. We will talk about those. So the bacteria is. Classified as pro prokaryotes. Prokaryotes. Prokaryotes means you will, will divide into two parts. Always do that. Pro is part and karyote is part. Karyon, karyote or karyon means nucleus. Prokaryon means before or it's primitive. That's before the nucleus. It doesn't have a nucleus. Okay, it's simple enough that doesn't have a nucleus, prokaryotes. If it does have a nucleus, you call it eukaryotes. EU means normal. I I'm just translating. If you understand the translation, it will make sense. Pro versus U. Karyotes, anyway, karyotes means nucleus, okay? Is it pro or U? Prokaryote, eukaryote. Prokaryote means before. Pro means before. So it is primitive too. It didn't come, go to be developed enough to have a nucleus. It does not have a nucleus meaning. So it does not have a nucleus or nuclear, nuclear envelope. And this is the bacteria in general. Uh, if it is eukaryote, if you put EU or if you put pro. Pro K or UK. Bacteria is pro K. Prokaryote. Division is by binary vision. And this is important to remember also. Binary vision. Binary vision is like this. This is one bacteria. Okay? It starts to do like this. And then like this. And then like this. Did you get the idea? Mm -hmm. This is called binary vision. Forming a furrow. This is how they divide. So one become two, become four, become eight, and so on. So binary vision is the way. The, the way of division is important. Binary vision. And you will see another, uh, other ways for different uh, organisms. Um, they have a cell wall that's complex and it is, um, will have different types depending on the bacteria. We'll talk about this. They have different shapes, different sizes. And you saw 
the Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, they look different. But anyway, uh, do you have, does the bacteria survive only if, you, if, if, it is, if it is in living tissues? No, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be living tissues. So it can grow inside your body, it can grow outside of the body. Remember the very first slide, what we said? We said it can grow an artificial culture. What's artificial culture? You get a dish, you put the basic nutrients, and you put these organisms on it, it will grow. Okay? So it doesn't have to be um, living tissues. This is the reproduction by binary vision, and the details are not really... I, I mean, if you understand this, you're good. And remember the name, okay? Binary vision. So one will become, make, make a furrow in the middle, and it will divide into two, two will become four, eight, 16, and so on. This is good enough to know. Um, this part, we covered it already. It can be in the form of bacillus, and bacillus is rod-shaped, spirochetes, which is spiral forms. Kakai means spherical, and it can be arranged in any one of these arrangements. Generally speaking, the bacteria will have um, a cell membrane and a cell wall. Is it the same? No, it's not the same. It means basically the same, but there is a difference. The membrane um, is inside and the, the, uh, the wall is outside. So if this is bacteria like this, okay, this black, this is a membrane. Most of the bacteria, not all of them, most of the bacteria will have additional cover like this. And you call it the wall. Wall and membrane, it's almost the same. But wall is outside the membrane. All of them have membrane. But the wall is an extra cover, like I'm wearing this, okay? And this is a membrane. I can put on my jacket, which is a wall, or not, right? So membrane is always there. Um, and this membrane is always selectively permeable. Allow things to go in and things to go out. Specifically, permeable, selective. It selects what goes in and what goes out. This is selective permeability of the membrane. Okay? Uh, if these bacteria have a wall, which is the outside, the outside wall, we're talking about the wall, not the membrane. The wall, the red. Okay? The wall outside. This wall, they developed some... Um, stain that's called gram stain the person who discovered it's called gram gram stain some of them can take this stain it can take it and some others don't take it so this stain can actually mix with the wall take the color and and others will not take the color if it does you call it gram positive and if it does not you call it gram negative okay so if you hear gram positive bacteria gram negative what does it mean it means the wall is different from bacteria to bacteria. Some walls, the chemical structure can combine or can uh, mix with the stain and others do not mix with the stains. It will look different. Now if you are developing an antimicrobial drugs, like antibiotics, Antibiotics, right? Where you have a uh, strep throat, I want you to take this antibiotic, okay? How does the antibiotics work? And this is actually important to remember. Okay, I understand it's medication, but these are the basic um, uh, mechanism of action, so we need just to remember this part. Something like this. Some bacteria are called bactericidal, and some others are called bacteriostatic. What sidal means? Hmm? Yeah. Kill. Side means kill. Bactericidal means it will kill the bacteria. Not all the antibiotics kill the bacteria. Some of them kill the bacteria. Some of them restrict the bacteria. Restrict. Stop it. It doesn't die. Strict. So you call it bactericidal antibiotic. If this antibiotic actually kills the bacteria, the bacteria is gone. The other type is called bacteriostatic. Bacteriostatic means stasis, static for the bacteria. Static means stop. They stop the bacteria. Are we following so far? Mm -hmm. So some of them bactericidal and some bacteriostatic. If you forgot it, remember, so we side. Homo side. Side. 
Side means kill. Kill yourself, kill others. Suicide versus homicide. So side, sidal means kill. So some bacteria, uh, some antibiotics are bactericidal and some are bacteriostatic. So something like penicillin, one of the basics, it will work on the wall, on the cell wall, to cause a defect, and by doing so, it will kill. This is what you need to know about penicillin. So if I ask you, penicillin, is it bacteriostatic or bactericidal? It's bactericidal. How does it work? On the wall, and this is what you need to know. On the wall, okay? Um, something like sulfonamides. Just interfere with the metabolic process. So it go to the, the bacteria, the bacteria is working on some reactions, it will stop this, these reactions. So it work on the metabolites, or metabolics, sulfonamides. Something like tetracycline, it's bacteriostatic. It does not kill the bacteria, just stop the bacteria, slow down the bacteria, restrict the bacteria, and it interfere with protein synthesis. So here is the bacteria trying to make some proteins for itself, it stop it from that by working on the chromosomes. Uh, Polymic mixing will cause cell membrane damage. Okay? So each one of these, is it bactericidal or bacteriostatic? And how does it work? Does it work on the wall? Does it work on the membrane? Like this. Polymyxin work on the membrane. The inside one. Penicillin work on the wall. The outside one. Sulfonamides, metabolic processes. Uh, tetracycline, it's, it's, it's bacteriostatic because it just stops the bacteria from making proteins. Does it die? It doesn't die. Why the bacteria is making proteins in the first place? To divide. If, you, if they don't have protein, they will not divide. Are they going to die? No. Just don't divide. Okay? Did you get this part? Mm -hmm. This is important. If you're taking notes, what I'm focusing on is the most important and you will need it specifically for the midterm and the final exam. Okay? Um, beside the cell membrane and the cell wall, some bacteria have even additional cover outside of those, which is called a capsule, which will be something like this. So what's the innermost cover? Membrane. Outside of which you have? So wall. This is the vast majority of the bacteria. Some bacteria, not all of them, will have additional cover, which is called a capsule. Okay? So do they have a capsule or not? Few of them will have the capsule. And this will add additional protection. For that reason, for that reason, if the bacteria, few bacteria have capsule. The vast majority is just have a membrane and a wall. If they do, they have additional layer for protection. They are protected more. And for that reason, they call this more aggressive or higher virulence. So if you talk about virulence, and, and this is important to know, virulence. Virulent means, if I'm asking about the degree of virulence of a bacteria, you tell me how aggressive it is. Why is it aggressive? Because it gets into your body and you cannot destroy it. So it will cause more, more harm. Are we following so far? Did you get the idea? So if I ask about virulence, if you see a question about virulence, virulence means more aggressive. Why it's more aggressive? Because it's more protected. So if enter, it enters your body, you're trying to kill the bacteria, you can't kill it. So it will propagate more, it divides more, it causes more harm. And this is why they call it more virulence. Cell capsule, external capsule, is one of these um, virulent factors. Did you understand what virulence means? This is one of them, not the only one. One of them. And we will go to the others. But this is one of them, so far. Um, some bacteria also have flagella and uh, pili or fimbri. Flagella is like, um, like a tail. Pili or fimbri is something close to the tail as well, so something looks like this, and something looks like this. This is a flagella, which is a tail for mobility, for movement, and these are the pili for attachment. It helps the bacteria to attach to the cells, to, to the cells, okay? Are we good so far? 
And the other thing is when they attach, the DNA within the bacteria, it can actually travel and go to, the, so this is the cell and this is the bacteria. Can you see this? This is the bacteria and this is the cell. If you have the pili or the fimbri, it will attach, attach. It helps the bacteria to attach, that's number one. Number two, it, it makes like a tunnel or a canal or something so that the DNA can enter to the cell. And if the DNA enters the cell, it will control the nucleus. And we will go from there and you will see that. Not all, not all uh, bacteria will do that, some of them. Okay, so what's the function of the pili? Attachment and transfer of DNA, okay? Cell membrane, we talked about it. Cytoplasm, just like the cell. Cytoplasm is this, the inside. Okay, so this is the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm will have um, RNA or DNA. DNA and RNA and ribosomes, we'll have the three of them. Uh, is this in the nucleus? Is, it, is this in the nucleus, DNA and RNA? Is it in the nucleus? Uh, in the nucleus of the bacteria? No. Does the bacteria have nucleus? No. no. The bacteria are pro? pro they don't have a nucleus. So, uh, we're not talking about the normal cells, not our cells. Our cells, yes. Inside the nucleus you have DNA, RNA, and everything. This doesn't have nucleus in the first place. But you still have the DNA and RNA and ribosomes scattered in the cytoplasm. So, does it have? Of course. Any living organism will have DNA or in anything. We'll have DNA or in. We'll have chromosomal materials or they don't survive. Anything, any of the four, bacteria, virus, protozoa, fungus, anyone should have some sort of chromosomes. Otherwise, they don't survive, right? All of them. But the difference is where do you have it? Do you have it within the nucleus or scattered in the cytoplasm? In the case of the bacteria, it is scattered in the cytoplasm. DNA, RNA, uh, and, and ribosomes. Uh, sometimes the DNA are in the form of fragments. Instead of being like, remember the DNA? Like this. And another one like this. Do you guys remember this? Mm -hmm. The DNA looks like... Some bacteria will have fragments. Like this, which is called plasmid. And plasmid is something that can be exchanged from bacteria to bacteria or from bacteria to cell. So two bacteria can come together like this, look at this. Two bacteria come together, or one bacteria and one cell, and some plasmids go from here to there. Why they are doing that? Helping each other, okay? I will give you a characteristic by my DNA, I give you something to resist, and you give me something. Exchange, okay? Plasmid. Now the toxins. Toxins can be exotoxins or endotoxins. Exotoxins, exo means? Outside. Out, endo means? Inside. Inside. So some of them will have endotoxins only, and some have exotoxins only, and some have both of them. Exotoxins is located in the capsule. So this will be in the gram-positive bacteria. So the presence of exotoxin, the exotoxin, that's in the capsule. It's outside, exo, outside. It's outside, not inside of the cell, outside, exotoxin. Um, this is produced by gram-positive bacteria, okay? Why? This is a gram-positive bacteria, so they do have three. The outermost is the capsule, and the capsule will contain the exotoxin, and if you add gram stain, it will bind with that, with, with that chemical compound that's a toxin. So you need to remember that gram-positive produce exotoxin. It's gram positive. They have that chemical outside. And that's why they reacted with the gram state in the first place. Endotoxin, on the other hand, is in the gram negative bacteria. And this will be released when the bacteria die. It, it's inside. When the bacteria die, they will, they will be released outside. Are we following so far? Anything? Any questions? We're all good? Okay. Um, some others will have not really toxins, but enzymes that act like a toxin. They damage the tissues. So here is the bacteria entering your body. Let's say um, flu specifically. Do you know what's the difference between common colds and flu, influenza? Which one is, is worse? Flu. flu is worse. Why? It's a virus. 
both of them are virus. What's the difference? Hmm? It's more, more virulent, different type of bacteria, but here's the most important thing. The common calls, the common cold, it's, it's a virus that go attached to the tissues, do some harm, but the flu actually destroy. It, it produces more enzymes, something like this. It produces something to destroy more tissues, okay? That's why it's more virulent, it takes more. Like you have uh, common calls, you, you have three, four days, and that's it, right? It's gone, it's mild. The, the flu, no, sometimes it stays for 17 days, right? Why? Because it cause more tissue destruction. They produce chemical compounds that cause tissue destruction. If you talk about bacteria, bacteria have something like that, enzymes. These enzymes are going to destroy the tissue. So let's say this is a bacteria that's strep throat, for example. Okay? Strept means streptococcus, and we know what strept means, right? What, what does it mean? Spherical structures in the form of? A line. Line, right? Mm -hmm. Streptococcus. So what's the strep throat? Throat infected by streptococcus, right? Mm -hmm. These streptococci, they're going to release enzymes. These enzymes released from these streptococci go to your tissues, to the throat, destroy them, destroy some of the tissues. So now it's exposed inside and it's easy to invade. Easy for other bacteria to come and invade, right? The first ones that are coming, they destroy, they work hard. And then the next group will come just easy and fit, right? So this is, these are the enzymes. So we, we need to add this and this to the virulence. So, what, so far, what do you need to know about the virulence? Capsule, toxins, and invasive enzymes. If you have capsule, if the bacteria have capsule, it is aggressive bacteria. It's virulent. If they have the endotoxin or the exotoxin, they are aggressive because it will cause more harm. They destroy your tissues, right? Um, with the toxins or the enzymes, same thing. So three so far that I want you to remember for the virulence. Is this bacteria more virulent or this? You're comparing two bacteria. Which one is more virulent? Meaning, which one is more aggressive? Meaning, which one will cause more harm? These three, if you have them, the more you have, the more aggressive you are. Capsule, toxins, invasive enzymes. If you have one of those, you're aggressive. If you have two, you're more aggressive. If you have three, you're more aggressive. There will be one more, but this is what we got so far. Are we following? Did you get the virulence? If you're comparing bacteria to each other, if I'm asking you, is this more virulent or this? What's virulent mean? Aggressive. What does it mean? Causing more harm. Which one? Okay? The more of these that the bacteria have is more virulent. Spore formation. This is number four of the virulence. So you need to add spores. These are called endospores. What are the endospores? Some bacteria, not all of them, something like TB specifically, and other bacteria. But this is just an example. Um, if if the if the the the, uh, the atmospheric uh, the atmospheric pressure uh, um, the atmospheric temperature, or if the medium is not good, like it's the, like this person is having TB and he is. Um, Spitting, for example, sputum, his sputum have TB, and it just went on the floor. There is no medium for them. They can't eat. They cannot survive. What should they do? They put them, like the hibernation, they put themselves within a small spore-shaped structure. They diminish their needs. They stay dormant. They don't do anything, but they should survive. Until somebody else is passing by, and this makes somehow and go in the air, you breathe it, and, you, and they will um, refresh themselves, and they will survive. So bacteria having this will be obviously more aggressive, and they cause more harm, right? It's hard to, to kill them. They can get into the spore form and protect themselves. So what determines, so far we have four factors to determine the variance, right? Are we following? You have the capsule, you have the toxins, you have the enzymes, and you have the endospore. Any one of those, if you have it, you're more aggressive, you're more virulent, you cause more harm. 
what enable you to do more harm? One out of two things. You're either producing something that's more harmful or you're too protected. So we can't, we can't kill you. Did you get the two? And, the, and, and any one of the four will get through this. So if, this, if, the, if, if the heat is too high, they can put themselves in any unfavorable condition. The condition is not good for them. Whether it's too hot, uh, you apply disinfectant. Disinfectant usually kill everything. Okay, or not, not everything, most of the bacteria. But if this bacteria can put itself into, a, into an, um, an endospore, you don't kill them, even though you're adding a disinfectant. Okay, are we following so far? You're adding a disinfectant, they put themselves in a the form of spore. It's too hot, they put themselves in a the, in the spore. Uh, there is no nutrients. You put them on a dry floor or something, no nutrients. Put themselves into an endospore and they will be very resistant. Number two is virus. And the virus, what we need to know about the virus is the following. Number one, all viruses, all viruses consist of chromosomal material in the form of DNA or RNA surrounded by protein. That's it. This is a virus. Chromosomal material. DNA or, not and, or. DNA or RNA surrounded by protein. That's it. Uh, nucleus, cell membrane, cell, nothing, nothing. Just those two. Remember this, right? Mm -hmm. Just some chromosomal material, some genetic material, DNA or RNA, surrounded by protein, and that's it. These are the viruses. So I said DNA or RNA. So the viruses will be classified into DNA viruses and RNA viruses. What's a DNA virus? The virus that have chromosomal material in the form of DNA. Simple. What is a RNA virus? RNA virus is something like AIDS virus, HIV. This is RNA. What does it mean? The genetic material is RNA. That's it. So that will divide these types of viruses into DNA or RNA. This is the nucleic acid that they have. Okay? And there is a protein coat outside of them. And this protein coat is called a capsid. So this is genetic material, which is a nucleic acid. DNA or RNA. Okay? And this protein coat or capsid. Protein coat or capsid, it's just protein coat. The inside is the one that can be different from virus to virus. Okay? The problem with the virus is mutation. What's mutation? Changes. Changing what? In, in this case, yes, it does mean change, but changing of what? Of what? Yes, of what? Of the genetic material, of DNA or RNA. And uh, I think you all heard about this uh, flu. Right now, they talk about it, right? They said there is a mutant new strain of, of uh, flu. Uh, and it's spreading, right? We heard about this right now. It's, it, it's just a different type. So they change a little bit of a structure like here. They, they switch something. They change the genetic material. And this is called mutation. And there is always mutation. We all hear about flu that it's, it's type A, B, C. Actually, there are hundreds of types. Mutant. They change. At the very beginning, it was few types only. And that explain why I'm taking the vaccine for flu, for influenza, and I get influenza? Because the, the vaccine cover the most common, not all of them. It cover the most common. There are other types, mutants. They change, they mutate, they change the DNA to protect themselves. Okay? Can be in any form. The bottom line is this. Genetic material and protein. This is the bottom line. Can be different shapes. Now, how the bacteria invade the body? Bacteria. Uh, I mean, virus. Sorry. How the virus invade the body? This is very important here. Remember that the virus is only a genetic material and protein. Did we mention anything else? Mm -mm. 
nothing. Membrane, cytoplasm, nothing. Ribosomes, nothing. We didn't mention anything. So these are defective. They cannot survive on their own. They cannot. So how they are going to survive? They have to enter to your body and enter to your cell, control your cell, and that's the only way for them to survive, and hence the name obligate intracellular organisms. What's obligate means? Hmm? Yes, they have to. They don't have options. Obligate. They have to. Th some others are called the facultative. Means they can enter the cell and they can survive them by themselves. But I'm telling you, viruses, all of them, any virus, is obligate intracellular organism. You have to remember this. It's obligate intracellular organism. Means you take it out of the cell, they dead. They die. They cannot survive. They only survive inside your cells. The bacteria, they don't do that. The bacteria, they survive anywhere. And they destroy your cells. That's fine. But they do not survive within. So this is obligate intracellular. Are we following so far? Obligate intracellular. They have to live inside the cells. So how they are going to attack? So let's say this is a flu virus. Here are cells. Okay? This is a cell. Here is a cell, and here's what's going to happen. Uh, what's the virus again? It's genetic material surrounded by oh, proteins. Protein. So here is the virus, genetic material surrounded by protein. They attach. Are we following? Attach. Number two, they open like this. Genetic material gets in, which is called uncoating. Uncoating, they take the coat out. What's the coat? It caps it. Protein, they don't need it. So only the DNA, uh, not the DNA, the genetic material, DNA or RNA. This is what actually entered to the cell, All right? Attach, uncoat, remove the protein, not needed. It was just there temporarily until they enter the cell. Now the genetic material is inside of the cell. And where the cell have their own genetic material? Your own cells. Where's the genetic material? Inside which part of the cell? Inside the nucleus. And we said that these are, these are DNA or RNA, right? Genetic material. So they go to the nucleus directly. They go to the nucleus. Take over. Occupy. The nucleus. And from there, it will tell the nucleus what to do. So I go to the nucleus. I'm in charge here. I'm controlling you. And I want you to do the following. I want it to duplicate myself. I'm one virus only. I'm the genetic material of one virus. So I'm taking over, I'm occupying you, here's what you're going to do. I want you to duplicate my genetic material, make copies. And of course the nucleus have no say, it's occupied, right? So the, 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 the chromosomes inside the nucleus, okay, so what do you want me to do? Make copies of me. Okay, this is a DNA, so the DNA of the virus. Copies, 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 copies. That's one. Not only that. I want you also to send messenger RNA to the ribosomes and make me protein to make my coat, right? They will make the coat. And then the virus will say, okay, you did your job, thank you. I'm going to leave. They will leave. And they will leave in the form of multiple genetic material surrounded by protein coats. So you entered as one and you leave at several. It's not four, it's anything. Did, you, did we get the idea? Virus, attach, uncoat, get rid of the coat, I don't need it. Enter to the cell, genetic material, DNA or RNA, go to the nucleus, make copies of me. Make copies, duplicating, whatever, thousand, five thousand, whatever the number is. I also want you to make copies of this, of this protein. Make thousand copies of this. Okay, so now you make copies of me and you make copies of my DNA. So they put together and they leave the cell. And each one of those will go to another cell and do the same cycle. Did we get the idea? Mm -hmm. Because if you understand this, you will understand how the antiviral work. We know the antiviral, right? The medications against viruses. They will work on one of these steps. So if you understand that, you'll understand how the medication works. 
After they leave, this cell is gone. It was occupied. I used all the resources inside the cell. I, I used you to make copies of me. I used you to make proteins for me. You're not doing anything for yourself. By the time I leave, death. The cell will die. Okay? And the viruses, viruses, a lot of viruses, will leave and go to the next, repeating the cycle again. So look at this. Here it is. Attach, uncoat. The DNA enter to the nucleus, will make the nucleus make copies of it, and make copies of the code, and it will be released. What's the latent viral infection means? We did that in the very, very beginning. Uh, 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 chapter one, do you still remember? Latent and prodroma and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what's a latent viral infection? This is where the virus um, enter to the cells, but it's still reproducing. It didn't do the harm yet. It's latent. Okay, they enter to the cells as a, in the form of infection. A protein is done. The duplication is done, but they did not cause disease yet. And some viruses will stay latent for some time. Specifically, the herpes virus. Let's understand what the herpes virus, and you will get what viral, uh, latent mean. So latent is when they are dormant, when they are slowing down, not doing anything. And here is the herpes virus. Uh, sometimes when you get flu or uh, pneumonia or, or any sort of infection, sometimes here or here you get um, these uh, cold sores. You get this before? You have these uh, uh, painful physicals, right? This is herpes. Here's what's happening for the latent virus. The first time that you are invaded, you don't know. You are dealing with somebody who's having herpes, and the virus enter through something, through your skin or something, specifically this virus. Will enter, go to the receptors of the, of the, of the nerves, the neurons, and go backwards in the sensory neuron until they go to the ganglia. Does anybody remember the ganglia? The ganglia, a collection of the cell bodies. So it enters from here and go in the sensory neurons, in the sensory nerves, until they find the ganglia. They stay there, they don't do anything. Okay? You don't have any problem. Until your body defense goes down for some reason. What's, what's that some reason? Anything. Something like you have flu. Flu is too ag aggressive. You have pneumonia. You're taking cortisone, which will lower your defense, right? You're too sick. You're malnourished. Anything that makes you weak. So now these weak viruses that are not harmful, just staying like this in, inside your ganglia, not doing anything. They are too weak. But if you are weaker than them, then they will say, OK, that's too weak. I'm weak, but I'm stronger than you now. They will exit out of the, of the ganglia and go the opposite way, go back to the skin here specifically and make the infection. And guess what? Once the flu is gone, this disappears, right? Did you notice that? It will disappear. Why? Because right after you kill the flu, the flu virus, you regain your immunity, right? You're stronger again. So we say, okay, I know myself, I'm weak. I can only invade a little bit here if you're weak. And you're regaining your activities, you're regaining your immunity, I will go back and hide. And they will stay with you for life. Okay? Did you get the latent virus and how the herpes virus works? Same for the shingles. Did you see the shingles before some people have like this red patches, red vesicles, that's very painful, stay for some time and leave? It's exactly the same. It's herpes also. Type, another type of herpes. They stay in the ganglia. They don't do anything. They are weak, latent, dormant. They don't do anything. Unless you are too weak, they go out to the skin, cause some infection. Once you regain, you, they escape again. Next type 
is these three, chlamydia, rickettsia, and mycoplasma. This is a unique type, and you need to remember these three. Unique. Uh, is this is a bacteria? Is this is a virus? It has something from the bacteria and something from the virus. They put them separately. That's why we're talking about those individually. Why are we talking about this specifically? Those three. You have to remember this. Chlamydia, rickettsia, and mycoplasma. These three types are actually bacteria, but special type of bacteria. Why, why did you sell, what did, why did you say it's bacteria? Because they have the basic structure for bacteria, and they also replicate by the binary vision. Do you remember the binary vision? Mm -hmm. Like this, and they start to do like this, and divide. They do the same thing. So this is bacteria then. Why don't you just put it with the bacteria? Because they are very small, and they are actually obligate intracellular. Uh, the virus was obligate intracellular, right? This is also intracellular. So this is just an exception. Three out of thousands of types of bacteria. I just have those three that are very small and obligate intracellular. So is it a bacteria or virus? It's bacteria. Why? They have a wall, they have a membrane, they divide by binary vision. It's bacteria, but they cannot live except inside the cell. If you take it out of the cell, they will die. So it's somewhere in between the bacteria and virus, but it is classified as bacteria, behaving as virus. Did you get the idea? So it's obligate intracellular still. Uh, they do not grow in artificial media, just like the viruses. Or, or it's defective. They cannot survive in artificial media. They have to, to, to survive within the cells, just like the viruses. So these are the three types, chlamydia, rickettsia, and mycoplasma that you need to remember. Um, can you give me examples? Chlamydia, what do you need to know about the chlamydia? It's one of the most common sexually transmitted disease. Did you hear about this? Chlamydia. We hear about gonorrhea and syphilis, right? This is more common, chlamydia. It's a common sexually transmitted disease that can cause infertility. Um, how about rickettsia? Rickettsia specifically, this class, it's bacteria, it behaves as virus, it's obligate intracellular, and they, 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 they live or they are transmitted from person to person via lice or ticks. That's their only vector. So they go from the body to lice or ticks, they stay in there until they are transmitted to somebody else. This is called rickettsia. So if I ask you about rickettsia, they live in lice and ticks. Okay? Mycoplasma, they don't have a cell wall, and this is the most important thing to remember about them, a typical type of pneumonia, atypical. There is a typical type of pneumonia, yes. This is not, we're not discussing all the pneumonia, but generally speaking, if you heard about this, if somebody's having a pneumonia, they will usually have a high fever, right? Sputum, right, a lot of sputum, that's yellow colored. These are typical, right? This can cause pneumonia, but it's not typical, like this, if you ever see that. Especially in kids, you go, uh, your kid is not having high fever, and he doesn't have a lot of sputum, not coughing much, and you go to the doctor, uh, your child have pneumonia. Pneumonia, no fever, no sputum, yes, it's atypical. It's not exactly like the, the pneumonia that we all know, mycoplasma. It will be mycoplasma, okay? Just an example of each one of those. The next type is called the fungus. And the fungus is eukaryote. What you mean? It means normal. Normal what? Nucleus. Nucleus. You don't have a nucleus. It's not prokaryote, right? They are found everywhere. And when they infect you, they call it fungal or mycotic infection. Fungus or mycos. It's the same thing. Fungus is the same as mycos. So fungal infection or mycotic infection. Okay? Uh, the vast majority of the fungi are non-pathogenic. Most of the fungi are non-pathogenic, meaning you have it, they don't do anything. Few of them are actually pathogenic. And most of the time they get through the skin or the mucus, like, 
like an example of this, uh, farmers, they are working in the, in the farms and if their skin is intact, most likely they are fine. If they have any skin abrasion or something and they go into the soil, there are some fungi in the soil that enter through the skin. So fungi, they do not path pathogenic by nature. Few of them are, and we will talk about those, but most of them are not. They do not produce disease except, except, if you have an abrasion, you open the way for them, so they can invade you. Or if you, if you have a problem with uh, your immune system, somebody like having AIDS, right? The AIDS, you're too weak, um, you're having a problem, your immunity is down, so they can invade. So if you have a problem like that, or, or disturbance of the normal flora, we know that, what's a flora? It's organisms that are not pathogenic, sometimes they are actually beneficial, that's all over your body, right? Any cavities, like inside your skin, in the vagina, in the anus, in the throat, it's all over. In the colon, it's all over the body, right? And they are non-pathogenic, um, sometimes beneficial. So the fungus, most of the time, they are not invasive, they do not cause disease, except immunosuppression. If you are immunosuppressed, your immune system is suppressed, is not strong anymore. What is this? Did you see that something like this before? That's white? No, it's fungus. It's a yeast, yeast infection that's causing this. This is oral candidiasis or oral thrush. If you heard about this, whitish, this is fungus. Uh, do you all have fungus in your mouth? Yes. All of you, all of us, we do have fungus inside your body, inside your throat, yes. We all have it, this, uh, this uh, fungus. Uh, does it cause a disease for all of us? No. Why? Because you're not immunocompromised. If something happened and you're immunocompromised for some reason, you're taking corticosteroids, you're too sick, something happened like that, you're malnourished, a problem, the fungus will say, okay, I, I, I know I, I'm living here and I'm not doing any harm, but you're too weak. I'm stronger than you, invade. Fungus, or a thrush. Um, yeah, the fungus, or a thrush, or all candiasis. Is it more common in children? It's more common in children, specifically if, if they are weak. Um, the example of that is histoplasmosis, for example. Histoplasmosis is one of these fungi, and you need to remember some examples of the fungi. Histoplasmosis is one, tinea pedis, candida anumo, uh, cystitis uh, gerbechi. Histoplasma is uh, something that can be transmitted from the mom to the embryo. And it's usually transmitted, like, it's more common in states like Arizona or something, where there's a lot of dust. It just flies in the dust and infect the respiratory system, histoplasmosis. Tinea pedis, or tinea in general. Tinea is that fungus that infects the skin. If infected, uh, what pedis means? The foot, or the feet, right? So if the tinea infected the foot, you call it tinea pedis, or the athletic foot. What's, what's the problem with athletes? Where do they have this? They are sweating a lot. There is no aeration. There is no a lot of air. They don't, they don't uh, wash that much. And they are playing all the time, a lot of sweat accumulating. And this adds humidity. And it's warmer, right? Humidity and warmer is a perfect medium for the fungus to grow. Okay? So that's why it's more common, again, in, in athletes. Tinea pedis. Pedis means foot. Um, candida. Candida is the one that I talked about, which is causing the oral thrush. And it can cause also vaginitis. They can invade the vagina. Uh, specifically, if you are immunocompromised for some reason, if you have a problem. Okay? Um, pneumocystitis... Uh, Gerovechi, it's just um, an opportunistic infection. Next up is protozoa. So, so far we covered bacteria, virus, uh, fungus, not protozoa. What's a protozoa? It's eukaryotes. What does it mean? 
normal nucleus. They have nucleus. What's the only thing that doesn't have nucleus or two? You don't have nucleus so far? Bacteria, Bacteria is prokaryote. And virus is not even a cell in the first place. It's not a cell. You cannot describe the virus as a cell. It's not. Okay? So it's eukaryote. It's one cell only, unicellular, and they don't have a cell wall. Okay? These uh, protozoa are usually um, in the form of parasites. Parasites mean they invade the body and they survive on your body. They have to invade the body. And the example of these protozoa are trichomonas, malaria, and amoebic dysentery, and you need to remember these examples. Trichomonas. Trichomonas is something like trichomonas vaginalis, for example. Some uh, ladies will have some sort of infection like itching in the vagina and so on, some uh, secretions and so on. This can be trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas, the, the vagina looks red, uh, itchy, some secretions and so on. This is trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, malaria, I think we're familiar with the malaria. Mosquitoes, right? And it's get the blood inside your body that contain the malaria. And where does the malaria live? Where does it survive inside the body? Which part of your body? Blood. Hmm? Blood. Yes, in the blood. They survive in the blood. And these are the obligate types. Some, some of them are obligate. They live inside the blood in case of malaria. Amoebic dysentery um, is more common in uh, third world countries. You go to Central America, you go to Africa, so you go to some parts of Asia, and you come back having a problem. I'm just coming back and I have this pain. Uh, I don't know if I'm having like diarrhea or constipation. I go to the bathroom. I can't really make it, but I feel like I need to go. There's always these vague pain, stuff like that. This is amoebic dysentery. Dysentery, dysentery, if you hear this, is not a and constipation, it's not a diarrhea. I call it disturbances, abdominal disturbances. Is it diarrhea? It's not diarrhea. It's, is it constipation? Not really. Okay? You need to go to the bathroom all the time. You have pain, but you can't really make it. This is called dysentery. So amoebic dysentery specifically is a protozoa that is transmitted in the form of cyst in the water. So that's why if you go like to some countries, they tell you, before you go, if you go, if you travel to, to um, uh, any of these countries, um, they tell you, do not drink from any water. You need to get that bottled water, right? They tell you for this. There are other things, of course, but this is one of them. So how does this transmit it? amoebic dysentery? Cyst in the water. You drink, the cyst gets in, patches, the protozoa is produced, invading your body. Can you get it out? There is, um, there is something called metronidazole, it's, an, it's a, um, a treatment, flagell, uh, flagell, this is a treatment for it, you can, you can uh, treat it if you know what it is. And it's usually if you're coming from, from any country like Central America, uh, Africa, Asia, some, one of these countries, if you're coming back and you have this, take flagell. Most likely it is one of those. The next type is not, not, not of, the, of these microorganisms. These are, uh, the next step is called the helminthes, and the helminthes is worms, basically, worms. It can be flat shaped or round shaped, something like this, and we're done with the microorganisms, okay? You got the four microorganisms, we got all of them. So this is not microorganism. These are the parasites, worms. These worms are parasites. Parasites means they survive on your body, on your expense, parasite. Um, and it can be very small, like one millimeter like this. You can barely see it, and some of them are like this, literally. Like a meter. They live inside the digestive system. And some of them are something like this. You can barely see it. So generally speaking, it's worms, and all of them, they share the same life cycle. These are ova that's changed to become larva, and the larva hatches to produce the adult. And the adult will lay the eggs, the eggs will become larvae, and the larva hatches to make the adults, and so on. Okay? Most of them will come from ingestion. You eat con uh, contaminated food that contain these worms, goes inside your body, and they infect different uh, places. Um, some of them invade the skin, something like uh, bilharziasis. If you heard about this, 
Belharziensis, it's very small larva, very tiny like this, uh, specifically in uh, water uh, that's not moving, any stagnant water. Put your feet in, it enters your skin, invade the skin, and hatches inside and start to lay the eggs. So you, you get it from either the larvae or the, or the ovum, okay? It's more common in young children. Why? Because young children eat anything, right? And usually they do not cause a huge problem. You can get rid of them, take the treatment, you'll be fine, except if you're immunocompromised. Now they can do more harm. And um, I wouldn't focus much on, on the helminthes or the worms. Just understand, generally speaking, what are we talking about. It can be in the form of the pin worms. Why did you call it pin worms? It looks like a pin shaped. They, they cause some itching and pain because of this. Um, uh, the tips um, start to like pin the, the, uh, the skin or something causing some um, heart uh, or uh, itching. Hookworms looks like a hook. Tapeworm looks like the tape flat. Ascaris is the giant one, and Ascaris is the one that I was talking about. Well, the, 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 even though the eggs are small, but when they hatch inside, it can be like this. Literally. Ascaris is huge. Like, do you feel it? Hmm? Do you feel it inside the body? You feel it inside the body? Okay. Most likely not. You feel some disturbances. You don't feel, you don't know that there is something inside that's moving. No. You feel, I feel discomfort. I feel some pain. I feel like my, my stomach is full. I don't know. I feel something weird. Some pain, some, and, and so on. But there are some treatment that, they, the problem is they attach to the wall and they don't leave. There are some treatments that de deattach them. So it can actually um, leave the body. And if leave the body is something from this to this. Now, yes. Is it possible for it to go through the large intestine if not, then your stomach can go up? <laughs> no, 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 no. These, no, they stay inside the larger intestine, oh. most likely. They attach themselves and they just stay there. Okay. And if you give medication, they, 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 they can leave, actually. The problem is they are attached. If you can remove the attachment, they will leave. Okay, and this usually comes from uh, contaminated soil or food or something that have the wor the uh, the eggs. Okay, here are examples: pinworms, uh, hookworms, and pinworms is actually uh, the problem with the pinworms specifically. If you ever seen that as child who's always itch itching around the the anus, um, these pinworm th these pinworms night time. They come out of the anus and they go around and start to like make some punches and, and, and make some problems. They absorb the blood from there and daytime they go back. So the child will say, I always have itching. And actually it's here in America. Some, some people have it. I have itching at nighttime around the anus. What is it? It's pain worms. Okay? And so on. Uh, prions. The only thing that I want you to know about prions, okay, in all of this is it's not even an organism. It's not an organism. It, it's a protein-like agent. It's an agent that's like a protein. It's similar to protein, but it can cause disease. Okay? It can go specifically in contaminated meat and specifically go to the nervous system, and that's all what I want you to know. Okay? What's a prion? And, and, and remember, it's like this. Prion protein. It sounds kind of similar, right? Prion protein. Prion protein. So it is a defective type of protein that can cause disease. Did I mention anything even about genetic material like the virus? I didn't say anything, right? Not a cell, it's not, doesn't even have genetic, it's nothing, nothing to survive. So can this grow on an artificial media? It's not even a living organism, it's a protein. Did you get the idea? It's a protein, but it can infect. Protein that gets into the body, specifically nervous system and causing problems. And this is good enough to know. Uh, resident flora. Where do we have these flora? Of course you have all different types of microorganisms on your skin, on your mucous membrane, in the nasal cavity, anywhere in your gut, small intestine, large intestine, in the vagina, in the urethra. So it's basically outside on the skin, mucous membranes, and any spaces or cavities inside your body. You have the normal flora, and it's a mix 
of microorganisms. The vast majority are non-pathogenic. They are non-pathogenic. And some of them are beneficial. Unless disrupted, they don't cause disease. The infection um, uh, can be, infection is organism invading basically. It can be sporadic, like one person here, one person there. It can be endemic, and we talked about those in the general part, the um, uh, chapter one. Do you remember this? Uh, what's the difference between epidemic and pandemic? Epidemic is just a country, epidemic is one world. Yes. And epidemic is higher than normal in one country, in one spot in the country. Pandemic in the globe, in different countries. Endemic is different than epidemic. In epi. Epi means many. Endemic means staying. It's endemic. Once you go, like, what's endemic in, um, in Arizona, for example? Hestoplasmosis. It's endemic. It's always there. When you go there, Lyme disease. Lyme disease. It's endemic. You go there, there is a chance that you get it. It's endemic, okay? Epidemic means this is not normal. It will have higher incidence in certain, at certain time. Now the transmission. The transmission, here is a person who is sick, and here is a person who's fine. The disease of the organisms go from this person to this person. How? There are different ways. One of them is direct contact. And the one thing that I want you to remember about direct contact and will give you everything else is nothing in between. Nothing in between. Patient, a normal person, they get in contact with each other. Nothing in between. Meaning, if I touch this paper and I leave it and you take the paper, this is not direct. Okay? If I drink from water and you take it, it's not direct. Direct means direct. Touch. Contact, okay? Kissing, sexual uh, intercourse. This is touch, direct, right? If anything in between, a, a towel, uh, any op anything in between, it's not considered contact, um, direct contact. Did you get that? What's the direct means? Direct contact means from person to person, nothing in between, whatever it is, nothing. If anything is in between, you, call, you don't call it direct contact. Um, the person who's having uh, the infection is called the reservoir. And reservoir is usually uh, somebody having infection or somebody, some, sometimes it's asymptomatic. A carrier means a, a person who does not develop the disease. This is different. Carrier is different than reservoir. Reservoir is somebody who is infected. He does have the virus He's, or, or the uh, organism. He is actually infected. Okay? Whether symptomatic or not, it doesn't matter. He is infected. Okay? And he's showing the disease, most likely. But the carrier is somebody who never developed the disease. So he is infective now. Next week, he doesn't show anything, still infective. Next month, he doesn't show anything, he's still infective, and so on. So he looks like a normal person. But he carried the infection from one person to the other. <coughs> Uh, the agent is the microbe itself, which is a microorganism. L like a when you say agent, you're talking about virus or bacteria or protozoa and so on. Um, reservoir, uh, we talked about this, which is where the microorganisms will stay until it go to somebody else. Uh, transmission can be through air, through water, direct contact or food. Air is air. I'm coughing and you get, you get the, the, the infection. This is called air. If the water is contaminated, I contaminated the water for some reason, you drink it, this is water. You contaminated food, it's food. The direct contact is touch. You have to touch the person, direct. Nothing in between. Um, who is the person who is more susceptible to get the disease? If health status is bad, if the immunity is bad, age, you can say the extreme of age is more susceptible. What do you mean extreme? Too young, too old. Okay? These are 
the, le uh, the, the, the lowest immunity, very old person, or a newborn. These are susceptible. Nutrition, obviously, if this person is malnourished, there are more chances um, to get the disease and to get sick. Um, these are the transmission different types. Um, we talked about the most important parts already. Water, air, food, direct contact. And direct contact, there is nothing in between. So if I tell you a cup, water, uh, a piece of cloth, a uh, towel, anything, that's not direct. It has to be skin to skin, okay? Touch, kissing, sexual intercourse, that's all direct. Anything in between, it's not direct, okay? Uh, for, the, for the air, it can be in the form of droplets or aerosol, okay? The difference is droplets is a little bit of bigger parts, okay? Um, aerosol is something that you don't really see it, like somebody's coughing and it's spread all over the air and you don't even feel it or see it. Uh, Vector-borne means there is an insect or animal in between. Nosocomial infection, what we need to know about this, the most important of this is hospital or medical facility acquired. You go to the hospital, you get disease from there, nosocomial. You go to a clinic, dental clinic, anything, any healthcare facility, you call it nosocomial. Did you get this? This is the most important thing to remember. What's a nosocomial? Any healthcare facility. You go to a healthcare facility and you get infected. Um, about 15% to 10 to 15% of the patients uh, get it nosocomial, but this is basically what we, the most important thing to know, okay? Of course, um, um, uh, healthcare workers are more exposed to that, but generally speaking, nosocomial means any, you get the infection from healthcare facility, okay? This is uh, the resistance that I was talking about, and I gave you the most important of all. Remember the four, four that make the virulence? You need to remember those, and this is the most important thing to remember. Um, here it is. Exotoxin, there is one. Destructive enzymes, that's two. Spores, that's three. Capsule, that's four. Uh, large amounts is number five, but it's not as important. But these factors are important. Virulence, okay? How about the host resistance? Uh, skin, mucous membranes are protective, body secretions are, not, are protective, phagocytosis, inflammatory, um, and interferon. What's the interferon? Here is what you need to know about interferon. Interferon is a chemical compound produced from infect, virally infected cells to interfere with the viral replication. Interferon, interfere. Interferon to interfere. So what's interferon? A chemical compound produced from our cells if virally infected, produced from virally infected cells. Why? What's, what's the action? Interferon to interfere with viral replication. Okay. Um, these are the factors that affect the resistance of the disease, are you good, um, are you, is your age is um, extreme, that will cause more disease, if you're pregnant, you're more uh, uh, susceptible, genetic susceptibility, some people have genes that uh, cause the immune to be deficient, if you're immune deficient, like um, AIDS or something like that, malnutrition, chronic disease, any one of these will interfere with the resistance. Uh, Pathogenicity is pathogenic, means the ability to cause disease, and virulence, we talked about the virulence. Um, we talked about mutation, specifically like something like uh, flu or influenza. This is um, yeast bacteria, 
or the virus I mean, change a little bit of their genetic material so that they resist more. Uh, super infection are infections that need multiple drugs. So normally, the normal microbes, when you take a, an antibiotic, you take one type of antibiotic. You take tetracycline, you take sulfonamide, you take penicillin, something like that. There are some infections that are called super infection. TB and Staphylococcus. These are specific ones that you need to remember that need multiple drugs. TB, you take three medications combined. You take three medications at the same time. Staph, usually you take two medications, two, two antibiotics, two types, in order to cover all this spectrum, super infection. Standard precautions. This is something that I want you to remember also. There are standard precautions and specific precautions. Specific precautions is something that um, you do specifically to avoid getting infected. By standard precautions is, here's what you need to remember, treat all body, body secretions as though as infected, as if it's infected. Anytime you see secretions, assume that it is infected until proven otherwise. Did we get the idea? I'm exposed to body secretion, but this person is okay. How do I know, right? So treat all body secretions as infected until proven otherwise. Okay. What's a breaking the cycle? Breaking the cycle basically means know the cycle of the disease. I'm giving you the summary, and this is the most important, okay? I will never cover 100%, but I'm giving you the most importance. Whatever I'm giving you, do this first. This is the main bulk. And then you can read more, but do this first. What breaking the cycle means? Simply like this. Um, Bilharziasis. Bilharziasis, you go to any stagnant water and you put your, your feet in, the larva living in the water, they're going to invade your skin, go to the blood, Go to the kidney, for example. The, the larva will hatches and make the adults. The adults will make the eggs. And when you uh, pee or, or uh, um, uh, produce feces or something, they will go out, depending on the type. And then they will go back to the water. And from the water, the, the eggs will change into larva. You put your, uh, your foot in, invade your body, go to the blood, go to the kidney, become adult, larva hatches, adult. Laying egg, the eggs leave. If you cut this cycle, you're controlling the disease. Okay? So cut the cycle. Something like just prevent people from uh, peeing in the, in the water, for example. Some people do that. Stop. Because if you stop, there is no way the eggs will reach the water. If they don't reach the water, they be, cannot become larva. And they will not infect anybody else. This is cutting the cycle. Did you get the idea? Um, to reduce the, inf the transmission of infection, cleaning is needed, sterilization is needed, disinfectant is needed, antiseptic in is needed, but I want you to understand specifically what's the difference between those two. Okay? Disinfectant and antiseptic, what's the difference? Antiseptic you can use on your skin. Exactly. For else. Right. Antiseptic is something that's used on your skin. Okay? Disinfectant, not your skin. You can clean the dishes with it. You can spray it on the floor, something like that. Sterilization is when you sterile something, make something sterile, meaning you boil it a lot. Uh, you put it um, in, in one of these uh, instruments that make that destroy it, destroy the disease. Incubation period, prodromal period, we talked about those. Do you guys have to remember so don't repeat? Prodroma, something like uh, have fatigue, headache, so I think I'm going to get sick, right? These are the alarming signs before you get the actual disease. Uh, sterilization, chemicals, we talked about those. Uh, infection, it can be local infection, something invaded this part specifically. Uh, it can become focal or systemic. Systemic means spreading all over. And I want you to know what are these means. If you know what's emia, you get everything else. What's emia? Blood. That's it. 
Bacteremia. What does it mean? Bacteria, Bacteria in the blood. Toxemia. Toxins in the blood. Viremia. Virus in the blood. And so on. Sometimes it is um, mixed, different types. Um, secondary infection is an infection that's happening that makes the body weak and you get another infection. Example, I have flu for seven days. I'm sick, feel bad, heat, um, I'm, uh, my body temperature is really high, uh, I feel bad, and then so on. You, you feel all that, that with the flu. And then I started to get better, and all of a sudden I got uh, higher temperature again, fever, high fever again, I'm getting even more sick, and it started to, to produce sputum and coughing and some, something like that. This is called the secondary infection. What happened is, the flu virus invaded your body, destroying some of your tissues, specifically like in the throat or bronchi or something. So, and, and then your body started to overcome the flu, it started to get better, but your tissues are destroyed. Here comes some bacteria, find the, the door open, they get in producing secondary infection. Did we get the idea? This is a secondary infection. So primary infection as it is healing, here comes something else because of your body been fighting and it's um, uh, having a problem and, and the route of entry is opened and so on. We talked about the local and uh, systemic signs of inflammation. I'm not going to repeat again. We talked about it. Culture and sensitivity. This is something that we need to know. Culture and sensitivity is, or culture and staining is, you take a sample from the body, let's say you take some sputum, you take a blood sample or something from the person who, who, the, who you think having the infection, you put it on a dish or something, you give them some nutrients, this is called culture, and then you can stain it and look at it. Is it blue, is it red? Meaning, is it gram positive, is it gram negative? This is one way. What's a culture and sensitivity? Culture and sensitivity is something else. I get a dish like this, I put nutrients on it, and I get a sample from you, and I put it here and here, okay? Here, here, here. And then I put some antibiotic on this, some on this, a different one on this, a different one on this. So sulfonamide, penicillin, tetracycline, uh, cyclosporins, uh, whatever the, the fifth type is. And then I will see which one is controlling this the most, okay? So spreading the, uh, the, the specimen like this or the, the sample like this, and I put the antibiotic. So I see this. This is like this, clearing, and this one is like this, and this one is like this, okay? So the one that's clearing the most, this is the most sensitive. If you, if you ever did this before, culture and sensitivity, uh, you're taking antibiotics, it's not very effective. Let's do culture and sensitivity. Here come the results. Uh, the culture show that you have streptococcus and sensitivity is tetracycline, for example. Meaning that tetracycline is the most effective one, which is this. Did we get what the culture sensitivity means? Culture, you culture it. You put it on nutrients. Sensitivity means you put different types of antibiotics to tell which one is the most effective one. And they actually, sometimes they give you more than one. They say tetracycline followed by sulfonamides. So this is the most effective, but if you don't have it, you can use the second one, okay? Um, blood work is also important. And if you do blood work and you see the white blood cells higher than normal or lower than normal, this tells you something right away. Even if I don't know exactly what you have, but I can tell is that bacterial infection or viral infection. If you have leukocytosis, I tell you right away, without even thinking about it, this is bacterial infection. If you have leukopenia, I will tell you that you have viral infection. So you have some sort of infection. What is it? I don't know. Do blood work and, and bring it back to me. I look at it. Your white blood cells are 30,000. You have bacterial infection. How did you know? Did you diagnose? No, I just can tell you just from the readings. Leukopenia versus leukocytosis. There are other things, differential count. Differential count means, you don't tell me that the white blood cells are a lot, that's not enough. Tell me which type, specifically. Is it eosinophils? Is it neutrophils? Okay, is it monocytes? 
Uh, and neutrophils mix which type of phages, micro or macrophages? Neutrophils. Micro or macro? Mo neutrophils versus monocytes. Which is which? Which one is small and which one is big? Do you remember that? Mono? Monocytes are? No, neutrophils are small, monocytes are large. So the neutrophils make the macrophages. Um, the monocytes make the macrophages. Both of them are eaters, I know. But neutrophils are the micro. Neutrophils, small. If you remember that model, the monocytes are big. So the monocytes makes the macrophages. Drugs work in a different way. Can be antibiotics, can be antimicrobial, bactericidal, bacteriostatic, we talked about this. Uh, antibiotics sometimes can be broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. What does it mean? We said that the bacteria can be gram positive or gram negative, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on what's in the cell wall. Broad spectrum are these antibiotics that work on all of them, positive and negative. Narrow spectrum are the ones that work on one specific type, positive only or negative only. Which one is better? You can't say which one is better. Because the broad spectrum, they work on against anything, but they are not as strong. Narrow spectrum, they work on negative only or positive only, but they are stronger. So it depends on the condition. There are different generations of each antibiotic. And the mode of action of antibiotics, we talked about this. Do you remember that slide? You have to know that slide that we talked about. Penicillin is bactericidal. Here's what you need to know. Is it bactericidal or bacteriostatic? That's one. And how does it work? On the wall, on the metabolite, on the membrane, on the chromosomes, and so on. Antivirals. Do you remember this? This is how the antiviral work, if you understand this. Either block the attachment, block the uncoating, okay? Block the reassembly. Do you remember the three stages? Block any one of those. The virus trying to attach, stop the attachment. This is one type of antiviral. Uh, the virus is attached already, and it's uncoating, taking the protein off. Stop it from taking the protein off. Why? Because if it is coated, they cannot enter. Uh, the virus is already inside. Do you have another treatment antiviral? Yes. You have the chromosomes and you have proteins. You have to put it back together, right? Stop it from putting it back together. And these are the three types of mode of infection of um, the virus. How about the antifungal, most importantly, interfere with mitosis or increase membrane permeability. Okay? You get those two? You have to remember this. Most important thing to remember about the antifungals is it either interfere with mitosis or membrane permeability. If you change the bare membrane permeability, anything can enter, destroying the fungus. Okay? Antiprotozoa is the same type of treatment of antifungal. So it's the same thing, either mitosis, interfere with mitosis, or the permeability. And that's it for this chapter.